Great, sorry. Okay, um, so uh, in North America, we have 16 tribes that are currently placed within the Tenebria Nine. Uh, worldwide, there are 26 tribes. So I'm gonna separate this for the purposes of our um, identification uh, kind of focus on what I'm informally calling the lower and higher Tenebria Nine. So we're gonna think about these tribes with simple antennal sensoria. And, and again, this is a major key character um, that are used versus those that have the compound sensoria. So within this lower Tenebria Nine group, we have the tribe Tenebria Nine which again, as currently circumscribed is definitely non-monophyletic. Um, and so here I'm just gonna kind of talk about Tenebrio and the related genera um, first. Uh, they have simple antennal sensili. Uh, internally, their procoxal cavities are open. So behind the procoxa, there's, there's not um, a, a sheet of cuticle that connects on the inside of the, of the beetle. Um, but also they have these simple, uh, defensive glands that share a common volume. And um, generally they um, have uh, these kind of coiled little spermatheci that come off of uh, the female um, genital tract. So again, maybe what we might call true Tenebrio 90, uh, we have Tenebrio, um, right, which uh, most of us have, have seen at one point uh, or another, the mealworms, um, again, simple antennal sensili. Uh, we have Idiobates. This is a neat genus that's in Eastern um, North America. Again, simple sensili. Um, and then we have uh, Bias or Bias, uh, I guess Bias, uh, which is in the West and does not have uh, antennal uh, or elytral stripe. Uh, within this tribe, uh, we also have two other uh, notable genera. One, we have Zephobus, which include the superworms um, in the pet trade. If you feed any uh, reptiles or anything like that, you probably purchase them. Um, they have uh, compound sensoria on their antennae, so they probably don't belong here, uh, but they do currently uh, reside in this tribe, uh, mostly more of a, a tropical group, but do get into the, into the U.S. Um, and Neatus, which looks a whole lot like uh, Tenebrio, um, but also but actually has compound uh, sensoria on it and uh, has some characters that probably needed to be moved to another tribe, Alpha Tobiani, that we'll talk about later. Um, next, we have the tribe Helopiney. Um, this is a neat, a neat group. It's cosmopolitan. Um, it's probably monophyletic, uh, more or less, as it's currently circumscribed. Um, and this is uh, primarily made up of the genus kind of, quote, Helops, which is a worldwide genus um, and, and was treated that way by, by many previous authors. Uh, it's been come to be known that Helops really is only this small group from like kind of Central Europe to about six species. And none of the North American species actually belong with those. Nonetheless, all of the recent treatments, well, recent being in the last 150 years, have retained the, the vast majority of the species in the genus Helops. Um, so we know that there's a lot of work that needs to be, be done here. Um, in North America, there are five genera, about 150 uh, species. Um, the eyes are, are transverse and vertically elongate. They're also kind of prominent. You can kind of see that here sticking out um, the side of the head. Their um, antennal sensoria are, are simple, just cetiform, and internally their procoxal cavities are closed. Um, and so they do kind of have this distinctive looking face with these prominent eyes. Um, American beetles will get you part of the way, but since then two genera have been added to our fauna and uh, no keys have been provided to the genus level. Um, perhaps the most complete uh, key that exists is, is horn 1870 to get to species for the US. They're much more diverse in the tropics uh, where you also run into problems. So uh, Helops is this uh, kind of neat genus. Again, we see these prominent eyes. Um, Tarpella is another genus that gets much more diverse in the tropics. Um, in the US and Canada, it's restricted to these kind of rainbow colored oily beetles on, in um, the east. Um, but we also have uh, Nautis, which again is a tropical thing, um, separated by some prosternal characters in keys. 
Uh, Nalassus was previously known only from the old world, but several species got moved um, from Western and East Coast, um, US and Canada to Nalassus. And also this genus ne Neohelops was described from Texas for these, this flightless form, um, which live out in the desert. And there's a lot of these that uh, occur all throughout uh, North America. Um, so all of these groups really need to be revised pretty, um, pretty desperately. So we also then have uh, Tribolini, and this is an important one. Tribolium um, uh, is, of course, a, a pest that, that it gets into stored products, but is also a model organism, right? We have the whole genome for it. Um, and if you've ever tried to do any molecular work with beetles, you've probably had to go to the um, Tribolium genome. It's a cosmopolitan group. Um, it's non-monophyletic as it is currently understood, we think, um, and uh, but generally these beetles are found either under bark or in duff or, or you know, get into dry stored products as pests. There are eight genera and 25 species in North America. Um, this tribe was recircumscribed by Doyen in 1985. Um, the Procoxy are, are subtransverse. The Mesotrochantin is, um, is hidden and the um, Mesococci are closed laterally by Sternites, which we'll talk a bit more about in some other groups. Um, so again, Tribolium and its closely related genera have simple antennal sensoria, um, and uh, the keys in American beetles and doyen do uh, work to genera um, still. So here we have Tribolium. They have these carinate elytral intervals. The key will work pretty well to separate them um, from Lithia and Lotheticus that have these real short stubby antennae, um, and, and they all kind of have this elongate little brown beetle look to them. Um, and then we also have these two genera in North America that are placed into the, in Triboliini that have compound sensoria, Hypogena and Mycotrogus. Um, Hypogena was recently revised and Mycotrogus only has a few species. Uh, but uh, again, they can be separated by the antennal sensoria. Again, still in these kind of lower Tenebrionine tribes, we have the tribe Apocryphini, and it's a, a small tribe um, that is found in North America, Neotropics, Paleoarctic. Um, it hasn't been tested, the monophyly, but probably is. Um, and it has this pedunculate body and simple antennal uh, sensili. Uh, these are kind of cute beetles you can find in, in leaf litter, the, this real globular prothorax and constricted base of the elytra. There's not much else um, that, that these guys are going to be confused with. So that brings us to the Bolotophagini. Uh, this is again a cosmopolitan tribe. Um, it's likely monophyletic. Um, and this has variously been treated as a tribe. In the past, it's also been called a subfamily, the Bolotophagini. Um, and they feed on fungus. Uh, generally, you'll find these on shelf or bracket um, fungi that are on trees or dead stumps, um, uh, that sort of situation. There are five genera and 15 species in North America. Um, and they're pretty diagnosable by um, their tarsi, which are kind of uh, compressed. And this first tarsimere is short um, on, on all of their, their legs. Uh, they do have defensive glands, which are small and, and simple, and they share this common volume. Um, and again, they have simple antennal sensoria. And again, we see this kind of coiled spermatheca. Um, the key in American beetles uh, works, works well. Um, and, and these are four of the five uh, genera. Uh, this includes our, our forked fungus beetle, um, which is pretty well known. And the number of antennal segments and whether or not the eye is fully divided or partially divided. And then these fly blade antennae are, are kind of the key characters that'll help you uh, diagnose these groups. And again, usually these are seen adults and larvae on fungus. Within this lower tenebrionine group, um, we also have uh, a Cropteron, a Cropteroniny, uh, which I don't believe has ever been recorded from um, Southern United States. This is really kind of in the neotropics, uh, but looks kind of like this Langurian aerotilid thing. Um, uh, pretty cool beetles. And we also have the Toxocyne. Um, again, these are closely related to the Bolotophagines and had been put in that subfamily by authors that recognize that subfamily. Uh, there are three Central American genera, um, two of which have been at least partially revised. Um, again, they're kind of cool. They have these long 
um, usually pronotal horns on most species. So uh, some neat groups. From here, uh, we're going to switch into, again, what I'm very informally calling the higher Tenebria 90. And by that, I just mean the tribes that have compound antennal sensoria, right? That have these kind of stellate um, sensoria or placoid that we'll get to. So first we have the Amerigmini. Um, this is a monophyletic group and it's distributed worldwide. Um, it's actually, we have fairly limited diversity in North America, which is kind of interesting given how diverse it is elsewhere. Um, we have two genera with eight species and most of those are, are a bit more tropical. Uh, the head is deflexed. Um, it's kind of hypognathous. Um, and usually the head's kind of retracted back in the pronotum these kind of um, elongate uh, reniform eyes, and they have compound antennal sensory. Uh, they also have these kind of elongate um, defensive glands, and you can't quite see it super well probably on this slide, but most genera have this little um, sclerotized prong on the inside of the uh, sternite seven that I guess is, we think is used maybe for, for muscle attachments for uh, the defensive glands or, or something along those lines. Uh, but that's a neat little synapomorphy that's in most genera there. Um, and so these are the two genera that we have, Maricantha and Cymatithes. Again, you can kind of see this kind of hypognathous head kind of that's usually tucked into the pronotum. Um, they have compound antennal sensory. Maricantha in the east has uh, spined anterior femora and Cymatithes uh, does not. Some, uh, some neat beetles there. Okay, um, now we get to the Alpha Tobiini. Um, so this is a worldwide tribe. Um, all of the species in uh, the new world are adventive. So we currently know one genus with two species. Um, both of those species are cosmopolitan as well that are, that are here in North America. Um, and this tribe is, is pretty well characterized by this kind of weird kidney bean or T-shaped um, sclerotized spermatheca, which of course doesn't always help you in identifying a, a pinned beetle. Um, the tarsi are, 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 have spiniform vestiture underneath, the CD underneath the tarsi are spiniform as opposed to maybe a big yellow cetose patch. Um, also the head is widest before the eyes um, and uh, a very unscientific character maybe is I always think they kind of have angry eyes they kind of have this little lobe that kind of projects out in this big kind of deeply um, interrupted eye from the epistomal canthus and they always just look angry. Um, so that may or may not help you. Uh, but again, there's just the single genus Alpha Tobias, uh, which has two species here in the US. The tribe Metaclocyne, uh, I believe is the newest Tenebrian uh, tribe described in 2016. Um, by Warren Steiner, uh, and it currently only contains the genus Metaclissa, uh, which is a cosmopolitan group as well. Um, and this, this uh, until the, this revision in 2016, it was placed both in the Alpha Tobiini and Eulamini, but it's also variously been in the Triboliini. Uh, so this will actually key out in two places in American beetles, uh, potentially. Um, in North America, there's one genus with three species. Again, they all have compound antennal sensoria. They have a co coiled spermatheca, um, these long defensive glands with distinct uh, annulations within. Um, also, the epipleuron ends abruptly um, at the anterior border of ventrite five. And so that can be seen here where this um, epipleuron kind of comes down along the side of the elytron and abruptly ends right here, kind of where the fifth and fourth visible ventrites meet, and it doesn't extend to the elytral base. This is a useful character in a lot of the generic level keys as well, um, but it is true of uh, Metaclissa. And here are the three species that have um, keys to them in uh, Steiner 2016. Next, we'll talk about the Centronopiny. Um, so this is a North American tribe and it's probably monophyletic. Uh, it's pretty small. Um, so externally, these uh, are very similar to the Nodalonini, which is in the subfamily Stenochiini we'll hear about later. Uh, but larval and molecular characters do hold this group together, which is uh, pretty cool. Um, important to note is that the, the genera don't actually key out 
to their own tribe in American Beetles. They, there's actually a, a combined key to these two tribes. Um, so just know that usually these, these all key out together and externally the beetles are hard to tell apart. Um, so there's three genera and 17 species in North America. Uh, they have compound antennal sensoria. Uh, the ovipositor is kind of flattened laterally. Um, the defensive glands are a bit variable. Uh, the sperma theca is usually absent or it's, it's really small, which separates this from um, nodalanines. Um, and the larvae have this, these um, strong urogonfi with all these strengthened uh, spicules on the ninth abdominal segment. Um, this was revised and there are keys to genera in Doyen um, 89. So in um, the United States and Canada, uh, there's uh, Scotobanus and Centronopus. Um, and then really cool thing down in the Neotropics is Tarosaurus. This is a big beetle that uh, has these long cephalic horn or that uh, come off at least in the males, um, though not all the females. And a lot of times these also have some sec secondary sexual characteristics for the males um, in these kind of uh, modified tibi which are neat. So that's uh, Centronopiny. Not to be confused with Serenopiny, um, which sounds an awful lot the same, uh, but they look pretty different. Um, this is a Western North American group. Um, it's monophyletic, but it has close affinities with some South American groups as well. So there are two genera with 35 species. Um, again, compound antennal sensoria, they're flightless. Um, they have an elongate head, which I'll talk about in a minute, and this abdominal ventrite one is, is pretty long. I also have these stout antennae. Um, these groups are, are fully revised to the species level, and they're available uh, keys for them. Uh, so we have Argoporus and Serenopus. Um, Serenopus has a, has a notched clypeus, and um, this elongate head is, again, not maybe not a super... Uh, scientific or, or useful worldwide character, but uh, it certainly helps me. Um, the head's pretty long in front of the eyes and the whole head capsule is kind of long in my opinion. Um, they kind of have these stout antennae um, and uh, the characteristics here, we, we also see that this ventrite, in, including the, the intercoxal process, if we include that, this ventrite one, one is about as long as two and three uh, combined. And so uh, these are pretty diverse in the desert regions of uh, Western uh, United States and Mexico. So uh, a very closely related group, Eulabini, um, is also probably monophyletic. Uh, it's restricted to the California floristic province, uh, oftentimes found in leaf litter under debris and rocks um, out there. And it's pretty similar to the Serenopiny, which we just talked about. There are three genera and 13 species in North America. Um, and again, they kind of have this elongate head. Um, the intercoxal process is, is narrowed um, anteriorly and they have these stout um, antennae. So these are the three genera. Um, we have Eulabis, Epanteus, and, and Apsina. Um, again, they kind of have this elongate head um, if you get a good look at it. Uh, Eulabis is monotypic. It has this, this, these carini down the pronotum. Epanteus is also monotypic uh, and it lacks a um, anterior margin along the elytron. And then Absina, which maybe all of these belong into, uh, has neither of those characteristics. Um, but some neat things uh, that you can find again in the California floristic province. So this is uh, another fairly new tribe. The Palarini has also been treated as a subfamily, but uh, mostly it's, it's been recognized as a tri at the tribal level and definitely been a, a tribe most recently. Um, and it's primarily distributed in kind of the Australasian, Indo-Malayan, Afrotropical regions. Uh, but there are several taxa that are here. We have two genera and five species, all of which are adventive in North America. Um, and again, they have these simple, um, so these should have been probably earlier. They have simple antennal sensoria. Um, they're, they're small beetles with, and um, their eyes are entire and not emarginate by the epistomal um, canthus, at least in the ones that are here. Um, and their antennae have these weak uh, clubs. So you can kind of see this weak five segmented club in Palaris. There are several species of uh, Palaris that are here and Eulomina that um, there's a single uh, 
species. And these are, are I think, also um, pretty commonly intercepted taxa, or at least can, can be kind of stored product pests um, and, and get into hay and that sort of uh, situation. Um, okay, so now we have the Eulomyne. Um, so this tribe is probably monophyletic. It, it occurs worldwide. Um, we often find them under bark and you'll find two, three, four, five species all just sitting next to each other under bark. Um, and uh, you'll find them in dead logs. Um, occasionally some, some of this group you can find in leaf litter as well. Um, this tribe used to contain just about everything we've talked about up till this point, but now it's been restricted down um, a lot more. There's six genera and 31 species in North America. Um, and we can recognize them, all of their anterior tibia, I wouldn't call them fossorial, but they're usually expanded and kind of um, have these stout spines. They have these long um, uh, defensive glands, but they also have placoid uh, sensilli on the apex of the, the um, of their uh, sub or preapical antennomeres. So not necessarily on the last antennomere, but, but around on the last few of them, these kind of flattened disc-like things, in addition to the compound stellate sensoria that are also there. Um, and so there is a key here, um, Doyen, he re-diagnosed the tribe and, and there's a key to genera. Also American beetles will work. There are only two um, that are in the US and Canada. We have Uloma and Utokia. Um, Utokia is uh, a fairly uncommon critter, two, two species, I believe, and um, they have this, uh, this line of, of large punctures that are under this um, uh, superintending ridge on the, on the uh, base or apex of the elytra, which is cool. Um, and then the Uloma does not have that. Um, I also didn't mention that, that this group usually you know, has a pagidium that's exposed, which is uncommon throughout tenebrionids, but this is one of the few groups that does uh, have that. And that's a good way to identify, recognize this group. Okay, so that gets us um, through the tenebrionine. And I believe uh, if I look at the schedule, I can turn it over to Kojin. Any questions before we move on? <laughs> Lots yeah. of tribes. Yeah, so that is a lot of content. There is a lot of diversity here, and uh, we really wish we had some really good, especially adult external synapomorphies to uh, identify these subfamilies from each other. But um, maybe you can find some and help us out with that too, someday. Okay, then, um, cool, yeah, I'll share my screen next. Oops. Uh, share, uh, no, one second. Oops. Oh, am I not added as a host? Oh, there we go. Huh. Weird. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about the subfamily Aliculini, which, unlike the Tenebrionini, is actually kind of easy to diagnose, as we talked earlier. If it has um, these pectinate claws, it's an Aliculine. Um, so this subfamily, as it's recognized now, used to be considered its own family, um, but now we just include it within the Tenebrionidae, Tenebrionoid branch. And like the other members of the Tenebrionoid branch, there are abdominal defensive glands, although they do vary within the subfamily. The abdominal membranes are visible and the antennal sensoria are a bit um, variable as well. Um, so the tribal classification of the subfamily is fairly simple. We only have, we only recognize two tribes right now, the Aliculini and the Teneopodini. Um, the Aliculini is divided into three subtribes, uh, three that are pretty much 
globally distributed, but the Zistropodina is a subtribe that's restricted to um, North and South America. And the other tribe, Tiniopodini, is just strictly uh, restricted to the Old World. Um, but of course, the common theme to this um, workshop is, even though there seems to be such a great character, well, those who study beetles know that comb claws um, come and go are associated with uh, beetles that like to climb up trees. And sure enough, it's not the best character for uniting uh, subfamily and Alaculini does not appear to be monophyletic as well. Um, so yeah, a little bit on the two subtribes first, or the two tribes. Um, so the way you tell apart Alaculini from Tiniopodini, well, if you're in the US, you're never gonna see Tiniopodini, but if you're looking at European taxa, the way to tell is that uh, in teneopodines, the eye is only ver ver barely um, emarginate, and there's some distance between the emargination and the insertion of the um, antennae. And then in Aliculini, you have the well-developed canthus and the antennae um, inserts right there, right there in the little nook formed by the reniform eye. Also, if you look at the abdomen, teneopodines tend to have the sixth abdominal sternite actually fully visible. So here's the fifth visible, um, fifth visible ventrite, sorry, not sternite. Um, this is technically sternite number seven. But the fifth ventrite is um, truncate. The sixth ventrite is visible there. And also the intercostal process is very um, narrow. However, in Aliculini, um, that sixth segment is usually concealed, although in some members of gonadorines it is visible, so it's not the best character. And the abdominal intercoxal process is prominent. Um, again, there, because you can tell there's some of this bleed over of characters, and if you look at things that are classified in Tiniopodini right now, they do share characters with Aliculini, so whether or not these tribes are going to hold up in their entirety still um, remains to be seen. Um, so when you look at the Aliculini, to divide the, to figure out what subtribe you have, you need to look at a few characters. First of all, you need to look at the tarsi and see if it has, if the penultimate tarsal segment has this fleshy lobe on it or it doesn't. Um, another useful character to look at is the prosternal process, whether it is normally developed, narrow, or absent, causing the procoxal cavities to be contiguous. And finally, another useful character is the shape of that intercoxal process, whether it's narrowly triangular or if it's broadly triangular. And when you see how these characters sort of um, are used to segregate the subtribes. The Aliculina is the only subtribe that has those fleshy um, lobed penultimate tarsimeres. The Gonadorina and Mycetochorina, these are kind of hard to characterize because, um, so some of the Mycetochorina, they have those really narrow prosternal processes or um, the procoxal cavity are contiguous, but there's also some in here that have normal prosternal processes. Um, so these two are hard to uh, distinguish in my opinion. And the Zistropodina have broadly triangular abdominal intercoxal processes. And um, in addition to that, let's see. Oh, how do I make it so I can see myself? Hmm. One second. Okay, so in addition to those characters, though, um, as we've been say, as I've been saying, that the monophyly of this um, subfamily isn't well supported, and there's evidence from this also from the defensive glands as well. So, if you look at the defensive gland reservoirs of abdominal defensive gland reservoirs of Aliculina. Gonadorina and Mycetochorina, it is very consistent. And I'm going to try to do some drawings here. Ooh. 
So if you look at um, these three subtribes, they have very bulbous defensive gland reservoirs with very, very narrow openings that open to the outside. But if you look at the Zystropodina, they have um, these really kind of wide um, sort of V-shaped V -shaped sacs with annular rings on them. And interestingly, that form of defensive gland reservoirs is also found in other groups of um, taxa that are currently in the subfamily Tenebrio 90. So whether this, so yeah, that sort of lends credence to the idea that the subfamily is not monophyletic. Um, so now um, I just kind of want to walk through the diversity of these groups. So the Alaculina is, has the highest diversity in the, U the Southwest US and arid regions of Mexico and Central America. And in North America, we have 23 genera and 350 species. And again, you can diagnose this subtribe by the presence of these fleshy lobes. Um, there is a key to the US genera, which um, was published by Campbell in 1984. And this key is reproduced in American beetles. And if you have an alaculine from the West Indies, is actually a key to every species from there. Well, every species as of 1971 from there published as well. The largest genus in this um, subtribe in this um, subtribe is Hymenoris. And the genus itself is hard to characterize, and it's kind of just characterized by a lack of apomorphies. And that will become more clear as I show some of the other genera within this um, subtribe. It is extremely diverse with 100 species in the US, most of them in the Southwest. And you have kind of matte brown beetles, like shiny beetles and some beetles that have um, humeral markings on them. But in general, they have the same body shape, um, just kind of ovoid um, beetles. Um, looking at some of the other genera, so you have um, Menetius Texanus, which you all saw this morning uh, or earlier today. And again, it kind of has that ovoid form, but it's distinguished from Hymenorus by having flattened antennomeres, and the head is um, completely covered by the pronotum. There's this other genus, Madrialicula, which also has that general Hymenorus look to it, but has moniliform antennae and has a unique character where the clypeus actually extends um, to the sides. More kind of ovoid beetles with apomorphies to them. So you have Telecycles chordatus, again, ovoid, but these have a notched at the base of the pronotum. And now Sia crassicornis, which again, ovoid, but with pointy, acute projecting um, hind angles of the pronotum. And yeah, all of these are, yeah, oops. Yeah, Madrialicula, Telecycles, Nausea, these are all just monotypic genera. So whether they're valid or they're just apomorphic hymenoris requires further um, investigation. So some of the other forms within the Aliculina, you have Aletheia, Aletha, three species in the Southwest US and a whole bunch more down in um, um, Mexico and Central America. But these have a quadrate pronotum that is narrower than the elytra. And in the Western US, you have uh, Stenochitis, which is glossy, long-legged, and almost has a, we haven't heard about the subfamily yet. We'll hear about them next um, tomorrow, but uh, they look like a Stenochiaine tenebrionid. And then you have Fetius. We have only one species in the US. There are many more in Mexico and Central America, but uh, members of this genus are lack flight wings and they have a fused elytra and have a sort of globose look to it. Um, the other major component of Alaculina in the new world is Lobopoda. So these are 
Um, these alkylines have really, really large eyes that are you know, nearly contiguous, uh, really big maxillary palpi. The head is almost hypognathous. Um, and yeah, very distinct, uh, large membranous pads on the tarsi. And although we only have five species in the US, there are about 200 described from Mexico, Central and South America and the West Indies, and um, likely hundreds more are undescribed. For North America, um, north of the Panama Canal, we're fortunate in that there is a revision to the species published in 1966. And all of the West Indies species are um, keyed out in another publication for, by Campbell from 1971. However, uh, the South, Africa, South American taxa have not been treated and you know, it's really hard to key them out or identify them. Um, so that's, that was the Alaculina. And now I wanna talk about the Gonadorhina and my Mycetocorhina. And again, I have trouble distinguishing these subtribes. So maybe some of the other instructors here can comment on what they use to sort of draw the line between these two subtribes. Um, so both of these subtribes, um, they morphologically, they differ from the Alaculina by the absence of those fleshy lobes. Um, a lot of these tasks that you can actually find during the day on foliage or flowers. Um, and there's some, you know, characters that work some of the times, like some gonadorines tend to have much longer um, uh, internal segments. No, internal segment number four tends to be much longer than three in males of some species, but it's not consistent throughout the subtribe. And again, in some mycetocorina, the um, prosternal process tends to be narrow or um, obliterated, but again, it's not um, a consistent character. So now looking at the diversity, Isomyra is the largest genus of the gonadorines in the US. We have 14 species of them and the Eastern US species were keyed out um, in this publication right here. You can distinguish these from other gonadorines by the lack of um, elytral striae. And one of the characters which is commonly used to separate species in this genus is called the ocular index. And you'll see this in publications about um, alaculines from other region, regions as well, but it's the um, minimum distance between the eyes over the maximum distance over between the eyes times 100. So you'll just see that value used frequently to um, separate out taxa. <laughs> Some of the other um, gonadorines. So in the Eastern US, you have Androcorus and Capnocroa, which have very similar appearances. They're sort of larger, more robust, elongate gonadorines, but you can distinguish them by Androcorus having really pointy hind margins of the pronotum, while in Capnocroa, um, the hind margins are more right angles. And these are active, actually this time of, we're getting to their activity season now in the Eastern US. And yeah, you can find them typically just basking on foliage. Another couple of genera is our Pseudocystella. It also has slightly pointy, but not as much as um, Androcorus hind angles of the pronotum. So Pseudocystella is a global genus with many, many, many species um, in it. There are five in the US and there is a key to species. Um, and this other genus, Chromatia, um, until recently was considered to be within Pseudocystella. And if you're using American beetles, this genus will key out as a Pseudocystella. And um, in the recent catalog, it was pulled out, but I'm not sure what the character was that was used to um, make that decision. A couple of different shaped gonadorines. So we have a couple of parallel shaped, parallel bodied elongate genera, Andrymus murray and Onicomara floridensis. Andrymus is um, found in the Southeast US and they're fairly, very, fairly variable species. And there are a bunch of synonymized species now under this name. They're parallel sided elongate. The pronotum is slightly narrower than the elytra. Um, the striae are distinct and the antennae are fairly long. 
and restricted to the highlands of Florida is Onicamara floridensis, described from the Archibald Research Station. And this species is characterized by its long sickle-shaped um, tarsal claws. The subtribe Mycetocarina has only two genera in it. The globally distributed Mycetocara, well, globally, except for Australia, um, distributed Mycetocara. And out east, you commonly encounter these forms that have very bright red humeral marks on them, but there are also unicolored species as well. Um, and there are keys to the species available. And also Hymenocara, which is described in 1978, which is a really, really small alkaline, maybe like two millimeters long with a very convex pronotum. And this is restricted to the East Coast and one species is found in the Sky Islands of Arizona. The final subtribe, the Zistropodina. So this is the, this subtribe is restricted to North and South America. And this is the group that we're not quite sure actually belongs within the Alaculini, might belong in the Tenebrionini and the tarsal pectin claw pectinations might just be convergence. But um, they're very diverse um, in Mexico, Central and South America. You get these forms, this is Prostinus that has really, really large fancy um, antennal segments. There's um, other genera, Tiza, like here, right here, which has more of a normal alkaline kind of look, but still has the characters for the subtribe, including the um, um, unique defensive ground reservoirs. And yeah, the easiest way to tell them apart without cutting them open is just looking at the intercostal process and seeing whether it's broad or not. And in the US, we only have two genera and um, four species. An amphidora, which is only known from Big Bend region of Texas. Um, and this is a flightless alaculine. And honestly, looking at this, it, we're not quite convinced that this belongs in the subtribe, but um, with only the holotype available, we haven't bothered to do any dissections on it yet. Um, and then the genus Lystronychus, which occurs in Texas and Arizona, which um, have narrow rounded pro nota and yeah, kind of these stout forms. So very distinct compared to the other alkylines we've looked at. So yeah, that was a quick introduction to um, the alkylines of the US. So with that, any questions? Okay. It's awesome that y'all are keeping detailed notes in the collective notes, by the way. Cool, okay. Um, cool, so yeah, that's it for the sort of lecture content for today. Um, next, we wanted to sort of just open it up for more, well, we're gonna, we'll take a break before we do that. Um, but we wanna open it up for just general discussions, um, not on the Slack channel. So maybe just so we can talk and hear each other some. Um, so we'll do that, but we'll also create a breakout room, Andrew, or do you want to do the demo? Yeah, so uh, um, one thing that we we were toying around with some ideas of how to make this a bit more interactive and, and useful. Um, and so uh, we'll have some more kind of these group lab activities tomorrow uh, that we'll do. Um, but one thing that may or may not be helpful is uh, I think I will share a live view um, from under my microscope as I actually kind of dissect some tenebs and, and, and pull them apart so that you can kind of see, you know, how are we looking for like the abdominal membranes on an actual specimen? How do we pull these defensive glands out from a specimen? Um, if, that's, if that's something that's interesting to you, we'll have a breakout room uh, during this kind of last lab time and uh, we can just kind of hang out and I'll see if I can manage to not mangle the tenebs too badly uh, while you're watching. 
And uh, other than that, um, yeah, if there are just general questions, we'll have a few just breakout rooms. Um, uh, we know this has been a lot and it's a long day and we all probably also have regular uh, job activities we have to get done. Um, so, so thanks for sticking around so far today. And we'll, I guess, just do that after a short break, Kojin. Does that sound good? Yeah, come back at four, at, um, in 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Oh uh, yeah, 10, 10 or 15, I think we're good. One Let's of do. the other sources that I would like to mention that hasn't been mentioned yet uh, for the US is the Darkling Beetles of Florida. That has a lot of good keys in it. And uh, especially for the people that are doing identifications, it's uh, often useful. Yeah, thanks, Rolf. Didn't yeah, we'll didn't put the that link to that up in the chat. Great. Yeah. So about uh, what want to do? Uh, is it is it four thirty right now, Eastern? Four forty five. Yes, we'll start these uh, kind of optional uh, breakout rooms and discussion. If you have any questions, let us know. Um, if you have any pictures or or Tanibs, um, or if you just you know, we'll have the the, the Zoom call open. And if you want to try to key something out while we're around to, to maybe help you, um, we're here for that too. So, so that's kind of just what we'll do to end out the day um, at your own uh, pace. And then we'll definitely see you all back here tomorrow on uh, 9 uh, noon Eastern. Yeah.